Good evening, everyone. On behalf of GE Healthcare, we are continuing our XP Connect webinar initiative. It gives me immense pleasure to invite you all for today's webinar. I'm extremely excited to introduce Dr. Ashok Kurana to the, today's webinar on assessing fetal flows, which is the newer techniques and applications. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Ashok Kurana to you all. Although, sir, doesn't need any introduction. Dr. Ashok Kurana is a pioneer in the field of fetal medicine. And he is the president of Society of Fetal Medicine. And sir is the, one of the ISWAG ambassadors in India and South Asia. Once again, welcome, sir, for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you indeed. It is a pleasure indeed uh, to be back with you in the uh, webinar series. And I am going to speak to you about uh, a topic which is not the usual kind of topic. It's different in the sense it's not everything about colored Doppler or the fetus, because that's not something we can do justice to uh, in, in, in an hour's time. Now, what it truly is about is the fact that we have to now realize that fetal flow is something that is extremely important for us to assess in several scenarios, and that the fetus is now accessible in terms of its flow. And I will take you through newer techniques and applications. And you know, that's pretty much in line uh, with what the Society of Fetal Medicine always thinks about. What we truly like to think about is the fact that we are rapidly translating research into clinical applications for the betterment of our patients. And so I'll show you how we moved on from images like this, which was our good old fashioned color, uh, uh, color flow mapping, if you were used to call it, and then uh, the spectrum doctor umbilical cord, uterine artery. We moved on to really things like this where uh, the actual resolution is so high that it leaves you no doubt that truly speaking in this space where I would have expected a three vessel view, I now see only one vessel and therefore I start thinking in terms of only one differential diagnosis which is a transposition. And look how easy it is now to tell the difference between a ductal and an aortic arch and you don't really have to make an effort. And I want to acknowledge uh, that a lot of this has been made possible by uh, the company of uh, Sachin Koshik, who is a clinical application specialist who might depend on a lot. I'm not the most savvy in this, and I think my learning curve is relatively not as steep as it should be, and I depend on him a lot for instant advice, and the smartphone helps. So what I'm going to take you through is way beyond uh, Christian Doppler, way beyond this kind of a uh, equation, which truly for you and me doesn't make much sense, except I know that I shouldn't place my transducer where I won't pick up a signal. And I'm not going to tell you that when the siren comes close to you, it's going to get a lot louder, and when it goes away, it's going to get uh, a little less louder, and so on. We will move on straight to transport you from a situation where we used to talk in terms of normal umbilical artery flow and then on to absent end diastolic flow, and then on to reverse end diastolic flow, and so on. And we moved on to what we thought was the greatest discovery of all time, which was the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity. And then we realized that we'd really moved into a much bigger realm. We were using color to define vascularity in abnormal areas, such as this goiter in this fetus. The 3D was, is only to impress you in terms of the fact that, yes, indeed, it is a neck mass. But what, what this image tells you is that it's an intensely vascular goiter, and that is a great way of following up goiters uh, instead of needing to actually puncture this mother again and again. And then we went on to uh, transferring all this information into the first trimester 11 to 14 week scan. A single umbilical artery over here, as you can see it, and we do realize that, yes, that we must start looking for the heart properly. And that's really become much easier with this kind of a flow. You see, there's great grayscale resolution. And on top of it, we've added this really shiny bit of color. And the shiny bit is not just shiny bit in terms of aesthetics. The shiny bit is better outline, better intensity, and much better filling. And look at this one. This is the ultimate answer. We're looking at eight weeks. We're looking at a bulge in the thorax and the upper part of the abdomen and the heart is like much outside the chest. A direct diagnosis of an ectopia cordis at eight weeks. You don't really need much thinking on that. 
Notice by this time I'm also differentiating in my grayscale the ventricular system of the brain. That's not as dramatic as the color I've added here. We know also that there is a long fallow seal along with this, and or maybe even an early gastroschisis because the umbilical cord is inserting on the edge of that area. So we're looking at a complex anterior thoracic and anterior abdominal wall abnormality, and we know that this is a hopeless situation. It's a diagnosis we've made at eight weeks. And we will discuss things like this. And I will show you how we are now in a place where we're no longer confused or lost or unsure or perplexed by what to do. We have new concepts in, new, in fetal physiology, which I will talk about, which is basically old wine in new bottles. Uh, but important to realize that we look at conventional doctors so differently. The most exciting thing is further information on fetal anatomy. And we're using the presence of color to define the anatomy of an organ rather than the function of an organ. And this is particularly important when we're looking at a small organ, such as the first trimester, 11 to 14 weeks window, or when we're looking at an extremely obese patient, where we're not making anything out of grayscale, and you suddenly realize that because color sensitivity is so fantastic, we're actually getting an excellent, absolutely excellent delineation of intracardiac anatomy. We're going to talk about differential diagnosis of anomalies and how color helps us there the prognosis of anomalies and how we should optimally use color for this, and also things like the ARSA, which are markers for anomalies such as the aneuploides. And then, of course, a word on safety issues. In fact, I'll start straight with the safety issues. And I want to dismiss this with a slide. We don't really need to discuss this because we know that ultrasound is safe. We know that transvaginal scanning is safe. We know that spectral Doppler is completely safe after 10 weeks. We know that transvaginal uh, Doppler is safe. That 3D Doppler is safe, but we always use the LARA principle, which is that because nobody's proven anything one way or the other, we must say that we will use it for getting an image as low as reasonably achievable. So once I get my image and I get my information, I will stop using it. Remember that here at the top of every image, we also have readings that tell us continuously how much heating is going on and what is the amount of energy being transferred to the tissue. You need to keep an eye on that. You can set a lock on it and then you'll never go wrong. And therefore, we have now a completely safe situation. Do remember that it's not fair to focus Doppler on the fetal heart before about 10 weeks, because that is energy that might be burning up tissues within the heart. And it's wiser, therefore, to use an MO to demonstrate cardiac activity. And let's just use Doppler after 10 weeks for spectral Doppler. For color flow mapping, you could use it earlier, and that's completely safe. Let's start with the good old a wine in old bottles. And the first thing we realize that one of the most common conditions, which is fetal growth restriction, is now looked at differently. We used to say, for the sake of definitions, that we have a small for gestational age fetus, which has um, a estimated fetal weight less than the 10th centile on standard growth charts. And then we always use a chart that includes a head uh, circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length never just the BPD and female length or just the abdominal circumference. What we are now using, of course, is standard growth charts, but we do realize that we've been able to differentiate the small for gestation age fetus uh, from the FGR fetus. And the FGR is a subgroup over there where the estimated fetal weight is less than the 10th centile, but we have Doppler parameters now within the definition. And the Doppler definition is that you should have a uh, cerebral percentile ratio less than the 5th centile, or a uterine artery which is greater than the 95th centile, or an estimated fetal weight which is less than the 3rd centile. So, immediately you realize that instead of pure mathematics, we have a flow function that tells us how the fetus is going to behave. And this is how we have now revolutionized one of the most common conditions we encounter every day, and that is fetal growth restriction. The CPR, as you know, is the cerebral placental ratio. It's the ratio of the PI within the middle cerebral artery divided by the PI, which is the pulsatility index within the umbilical artery. And if that's less than the fifth centile for gestational age, that means trouble, and that is the baby that needs surveillance. It's not an indicator that you need to deliver immediately. We talk now in Doppler in terms of the definition of growth restriction, and we talk about Doppler in terms of the management of growth restriction. And the two are completely different. We will discuss those in the next few minutes. Not in detail, but just to show you how Doppler has made such a difference and how fetal flow 
as such a decision helping role now in terms of how to diagnose and when to deliver. We also, if we follow not the beautiful randomized control trials on which the Barcelona definitions are based, uh, we could move on to the Delphi consensus, which you know is a, a group of experts who got together and felt that yes, this is the way we will diagnose this and then we will follow up. And um, again, they divide uh, two groups, one which is uh, early free growth restriction, which is less than 32 weeks in the absence of congenital anomalies, versus late free growth restriction, decision age greater than or equal to 32 weeks in the absence of congenital anomalies. And here again, they don't talk in terms of only an abdominal circumference or estimated fit weight less than third centile, but they've added an or. So even if you have an umbilical artery which is absent end diastolic, what I've just listed as one, two, three in the left column, which is that you add on a uterine artery PI greater than the 95th centile or an umbilical artery PI greater than the 95th centile. Not as sharp as the Barcelona definitions, but you see the Barcelona definitions is a randomized controlled trial. The Delphi consensus is a bunch of experts. The value is far more in an RCT compared to a bunch of experts. I do respect the experts. There's no doubt they're wonderful people. Uh, but the fact remains that the uh, evidence is more robust when you look at the Barcelona group. Uh, there is similar uh, throwing over of lots of stuff, such as the CPR, thrown in even for the definition of the late group. And it's useful to know that that also exists. Uh, remember that growth centiles are always on more customized, uh, customized centiles. And therefore, again, for the definition of growth restriction, even this expert group uh, has said, yes, we will do it. We also realize that we have divided our growth restricted babies into two groups, an early onset, which is less than 32 weeks, and a late onset, which is greater than 32 weeks. These are two distinct phenotypes and should be recognized as such. And there is possibly also a third phenotype that is now emerging, and that is the hypertensive fetal growth restriction. This group is perhaps the most dangerous one because they suffer the most, and we are now beginning to recognize that they will, and perhaps in the year to come, we will have more information on them. When we look at these groups, we realize that we no longer look at them in a very simple way. We look at them as first realizing that the uterine artery is to be assessed every time there is a growth scan, even if the reading was normal at the time of the 11 to 14 weeks window, and even if the reading was normal at the time of the anomaly scan, that is the 20 to 22 weeks window. You will still repeat it, and it will be part of protocol, and we will not use an absolute value. We will follow the gestational age-related indices uh, for the uterine artery pulsatility index. The cerebral percentage ratio, as I was mentioning, is the ratio of the MCA PI divided by the umbilical artery PI. And it's found to be reliable than just using the umbilical artery alone or using the middle center of the artery alone. The moment you divide this, you get much more reliability. Also do remember that you can have a perfectly normal range umbilical artery PI. You could have a perfectly normal range middle cerebral artery PI in that patient, and yet the cerebral percentage ratio would be abnormal so here again, fetal flow abnormality is recognized as an indicator of impending fetal problems, and it is easy to recognize by reinterpreting conventional flow parameters. The uh, other new parameter is the aortic isthmus, and we do realize that this is a useful parameter because when you assess the aortic isthmus, the changes precede those in the ductus venosus, and therefore you have enough time to prepare the family, to prepare the fetus, to give corticosteroids in case you think is necessary, and time to organize which nursery, when nursery, in utero transfer, et cetera, et cetera. So it helps tremendously with logistics and improves the face safety of the fetus after it arrives. Do remember that in terms of decision making, ductus venosus evaluation is the cornerstone for assessing when to uh, deliver in early onset growth restriction, and the cerebral percentage ratio is a critical index in the late onset FGR greater than 32 weeks. There are these criteria that we like to follow of the classification, where we realize that we have stage one, two, three, and four, depending on what is missing. In fact, you notice in the right-hand column, uh, the pink ones have disappeared. So we no longer use just the umbilical artery PI or the MCA PI, 
we actually use the CPR and we use the unit battery PI. In the grade two, which you notice in the last column in the second block, the moment you have an umbilical artery absent in diastolic velocity or reversal in the aortic isthmus, you realize that you're looking at a grade two. And then, of course, if you have reversal in the umbilical artery or a ductus venosus PI greater than the 95th centile, you know you're looking at a low suspicion fetal acidosis and it's time to wake up. And of course, if you have reversed the ductus venosus, an abnormal computerized CTG uh, or uh, fetal heart rate decelerations in your conventional monitoring, then you know that yes, you have very little time left and you need to act. How do you need to act? Again, very well delineated in these, and they tell you exactly what you should be doing. Uh, a weekly monitoring or a bi-weekly or one to two days or 12 hours. Also, in terms of delivery, what to do, the last column shows that. Uh, at the moment you find all these derangements, you say, okay, 37 weeks labor induction. If she's more than 34, um, then, 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 then there's a cesarean section possibly. And of course, as you go backward, that's what she will do. Also, this flow has been read arranged in terms of a smartphone app. And I find this terribly convenient. You can download this free from www.medicinafetalbarcelona.org. And you put in the data you have, 37 weeks, four days, um, 1.8 kilos. You put in your Doppler data, you press calculate, and the answer you get is, look, this is growth restriction, we have 37 weeks, deliver. Alternatively, if I were to mention the age is 34 weeks, as you see here at the top on the left, then the instructions are quite different. Here, the risk of delivery and the risk of prematurity exceed the risk of intrauterine trouble. Therefore, we then can afford to carry on and say, yes, we'll wait a while and deliver later. Something very simple. Remember that every day we get new information on other simple things that we take for granted as well. And one of them is this. And that is here. You see the uterine artery, usual mid sagittal section of the uterus and cervix and long axis, and you've insulated it. You do realize that if I want to make sure that it's the right vessel, uh, I must use an insulation angle less than 30 degrees and then look for a peak systolic velocity more than 60 and then I measure my PI. But importantly, if I'm doing that, I must understand that a transvaginal reading would be quite different from a transabdominal reading because of uh, the fact that you are insulating these from a different angle, uh, because of the fact that you might be compressing the cervix, and that in general, uterine artery resistance is higher on transvaginal scans uh, compared to transabdominal measurements. So something very simple about flow, it is something that we do realize is old wine and new bottles, but the new bottle is absolutely fantastic, and that is what we uh, try to aim. Remember that we don't use a notch anymore. What we say is, yes, here's a simple situation where we measure the PI and we watch the chain. The, uh, the yellow picture above on the right side tells me that, that there is a high impedance flow with very little flow at the end of the cardiac cycle. And the lower image tells me that there's ample flow. And we don't use them individually, and we don't use the notch. We take the mean of the right uterine artery PI and the left uterine artery PI, and then we say, OK, this is how it's going to work. You must get clean velocity waveforms, as you see on the, on the top left. And once you've done that, you can do it. Remember, the only indices we now use are the PI and occasionally the peak systolic velocity when we're looking at fetal anemia. Beyond that, we do not use any of the other indices. And please do remember that we threw the notch out. There's enough literature, as you see in this slide, telling me that, look, uh, this is a situation where uh, the notch is subjective. This is a situation where a lot of uterine artery PIs will show a notch at 11 to 14 weeks. And therefore, we do not use the notch as a criterion. We should only use the PI. What else do we use at this stage of the 11 to 14 week scan? We realized that the ductus venosus is useful as an independent marker for trisomy 21. 5% of normal fetuses might show it, but the important thing is that the criteria have changed. 
We used to probably believe that the image on the right, with the reverse flow at the end of the cardiac cycle, is something that would be characteristic of trauma. However, we do realize that the bottom image on the left, which shows reduced forward flow in the A wave, is equally important, and that the importance is not reverse flow, but an altered PI, which is a higher PI, and not just reverse flow. So that is the change that we have seen over the last few years. The criteria for tricuspid regurgitation are exactly the same as before at this window. However, we do realize that if you have superior equipment, which is either medium or high-end equipment, you will, as the bottom right shows, be able to get much more reliable flow velocity waveforms, and you'll be able to appreciate the degree of regurgitation much better. And in fact, you'll be able to appreciate uh, the other thing, that, which is that the reliability of a trivial TR then becomes quite different. Also remember that at the 11 to 14 weeks window, we now use flow routinely for cardiac anatomy. We do not believe that as before, we used to actually have, um, like we used to think, um, that we can see everything in grayscale. No, uh, we go beyond grayscale. And we realize that we must have one of these two images, one to show the inflows, which are the two reds on the bottom left, and the two blues, which are in the middle on the right. We can either show uh, the, uh, the convergence of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, two great vessels or just running them parallel. And of course, access is important. But you must realize that uh, you use a cardiac preset. You don't use ordinary presets. You always use color for cardiac anatomy in the first trimester, 11 to 14 weeks. 12 weeks remains the best, and you may or may not require transvaginal scans. Maybe for problem solving, yes, maybe in the patients where the fetus is not really cooperative, or in the very obese patient with lower abdominal obesity, yes, but not otherwise. And we are now getting images of the sort that you see here uh, on a very routine basis, transabdominal scans, 12 weeks, and you can see that it's working nicely. I notice that my arrow has disappeared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this off and re-switch it on in a minute because I think it's not going to be as much fun until I actually point out some of these structures. So bear with me for a second when I reset this talk and make sure uh, that we get that arrow going because that pointer is very essential uh, for me to be able to share things with you. So we will just run these down to, to that point where we were. And hopefully we will have my pointer in place. Um, yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. That doesn't work. So we will have to work it all the way up. And then get this off and then get it back on again. So essentially what is happening is that we're learning that there is no such thing as color Doppler ultrasound uh, in obstetrics or color Doppler uh, ultrasound um, uh, anomaly scan as such. Color Doppler is now a very integral part of the ultrasound examination. So that category by itself uh, truly uh, does not exist anymore. And we must open our mind to the fact uh, that what we really need is something uh, where we have uh, the color as an option at all times. We cannot separate the two. And let me see if my the arrow has come back, and I find the arrow is back. So note the inflows in orange, and note the outflows in blue, and notice how much more information you get compared to the grayscale image on the left side, and compared, and look at the one on the right side, which is color, and how exquisite it is, how more convincing it is, and it really gives you diagnostic confidence. In fact, you can stretch it with a single button and say, okay, I have my controls at the bottom, and in those controls, I can see that I can get an outline, which we call a silhouette mode. I can do a 3D acquisition kind of story, as I see here. I blank out my uh, grayscale to the extent possible. I still have some outline, and I get a far better orientation of my inflows, which are still orange, and my outflows, which are still blue, and it's very convincing information. Here is grayscale plus flow information, and on the right is uh, exclusively flow information, and all this is not complicated. It's a single touch button. If you use uh, the higher end equipment, it's uh, one touch, and if you use the lower end, it's a drop down menu, which you get used to. And 
uh, what you can do is also go beyond and realize that your conventional methods of looking, such as TUI or multi-slice imaging, can be done at the 11 to 14 weeks window as well. And it's an excellent way of showing anatomy and increasing diagnostic confidence. And therefore, if I keep consistently getting vessels like this, which is I'm picking up two nice inflows, I might be picking up a bit of a vessel here, which is quite normal. But if I don't do that and I keep picking up only one vessel, I know I must start looking for a transposition of the greater arteries. Remember that even the simple things like, should I terminate uh, conjoined twins or should I not? I have answers. Because I can map conjoined twins. I use a combination of 3D power Doppler, VCI, which is volume contrast imaging that gives me sections. And I then use a translation cine, as you see here, to show that there's a complete disaster in terms of uh, the vascularity here. We have a single large vessel umbilical cord, a huge amount of shared vascularity in the lower part of the abdominal wall, throughout the abdomen, and even all the way into the thorax. And therefore, I'm going to be looking at a disaster later on. And of course, this is the delivery. So and this is the stage where you can convince the patient that this is a lethal abnormality and would they like to carry on or not. And therefore, there's a lot of use that we will now highlight. I will now take you through the recent advances and put them into perspective, not just the recent repackaging, which is what we were discussing at the moment, but recent advances in terms of what we're going to be doing. So, we will show you examples of how to exclude or confirm the vascular nature of a cystic mass, which means I see an anechoic area, I think it's a fluid collection, and I don't realize it's blood, I switch on blood, I switch on flow, I get the answer, this is blood. You can then go on to another situation where any mass that you see in the fetus, you switch on vascularity, and you will get an idea on whether it's vascular or not, where the vessel comes from, and in fact, you can sit and work on a differential diagnosis and prognosis based on that, we will show you cases. And like I said, also to define anatomy. We started slowly. Uh, we started around the turn of the century, when we replaced some of the flows um, that we were getting with color flow like so, with power Doppler. Power Doppler was coded as orange and yellow traditionally, and unlike color Doppler, it did not depend on flow direction, mean velocity and range of velocities. What we were looking at was detecting energy and displaying them as intensity, and because of this physics, we were picking up slow flow sensitivity, which is fetal vessels. Omnidirectional vessels, which is vessels within an organ. And then we made another step, and that was directional power Doppler, where we were not losing direction. We were back to our blues and reds, and we knew which direction the flow was coming in from. And those were the initial steps. But we saw a jump. The jump was looking at flow and immediately realizing that we were able to do 3D and color together. We were able to get 3D uh, color Doppler. In fact, this is not just 3D, this is live, and this is vascular information live. You could slice it, you could reconstruct it, you could rotate it like we do routinely in 3D. You could actually see the entire aorta and the great vessel without having to imagine them. You can actually see where the inferior vena cava, uh, vena cava comes in and the great vessels that go in into the vena cava, the hepatic arteries and so on. And you could even, if you thought that there was too much of vessels in this area, get yourself unobsessed with the thickness, move on to a silhouette mode or an outline mode and pick up vessels like this as you see here. Look how beautifully you pick up the vena cava, the ductus venosus and so on, the arch of the aorta, all as individuals and you see through and through. You're actually able to see all these vessels so neatly and cleanly by acquiring, turning a single button, and getting this information. We were struggling with this information with the old technology. Uh, we were trying to invert information and say, okay, we make black into white, white into black, and we give you anatomy. We tried to use power Doppler, and this was so slow, so long to acquire, the fetus used to move, but it gave us answers. We did play around with the intervention of the septum and say, oh yes, I see flow in the septum. 
this is a ventric perceptron defect, but it used to take an effort. We also moved on to non-flow flow. What's non-flow flow? It's B-flow, which means that the emptiness is recognized as something that should be working like that. And then we realize that, yes, ah, my apologies for this video not working. It will sort of come on in a few seconds. Uh, but what the equipment does is realize that these are echoes that are not moving and that they will move ultimately and that we will get an answer in terms of what is going on. So in that situation, then we say, yes, uh, we will reconstruct anatomy with the flow void, much as we do in MR. And then we realized that, yes, we were moving in the right direction. I noticed that my PowerPoint is thinking. When it starts thinking, that's sort of dangerous. But I'm going to try and switch this off and get back into this mode again. Otherwise, it might take us the better part of the night for the equipment to sort of wake up. So uh, uh, bear with me. You can go get your little cup of tea if you wish in the next one minute, because this is a bit of an exercise where I have to uh, switch off the whole thing and re-switch it on again without getting worried about it. And that's what I've done now. And I think the sound will still carry on. And so don't get upset that, you know, what, what happened to my webinar? Um, that does happen with very heavy videos sometimes. And so the computer will come on again. We'll show you a nice picture of the Colosseum, which is my current favorite, as the background. And then we will switch on this again, and it will uh, play fine. Because this happens sometimes with some of the older videos. What I was showing you was reconstruction of cardiac structure that we used to do in the 2001-2002 era, where we did realize that you could convert the absence uh, of, um, of solid echoes into information that would give you echoes that you could recognize. That was called B-flow. And it was also called inversion mode, where you could make fluid, which is classically uh, black, into liquid, which is classically unblack. And then we could reverse that. We're taking a few seconds to get back where we were. And then uh, we will get going in a few seconds. And there we are. Some of these will just start off on their own. And that's usually the thing with technology. We never panic when technology lets us down, because we do understand that most of the times our technology will be kind to us and sort of wake up and, and do things for us as we like it to do things for us. And so we will get back into this program. There we are. We're trying to keep the iCloud out because sometimes the iCloud is very overwhelming. And then I think we are back in towards so far. And we should be able to get this going in a few seconds. Sorry for the title slide all over again. But we will shift directly uh, to the slide where we were at and move on from that particular point. So what I was trying to show you was the fact that we were using some of the old stuff. And while we were using that, we realized that a lot of new things were happening in technology. And this is how we do reconstructions today. You see here that you have HD flow, which is a, a form of flow that we use, uh, which is not classical color, but which is a form of the power Doppler or directional Doppler, HD flow. And we use stick. And look at the anatomy it's demonstrating for me. I'm looking at one vessel coming this way. I'm looking at the other vessel coming this way. I know that this is a translation of my 3D view. I can look at it like this in this rendering with just the vessels. Or I can look at it like this, which is a multi-slice showing me in the center my four chamber. As I go higher, I see my great vessels. And as I go lower, I see abdominal vessels. And I see the star sitting right there. So all my information that I need is on display in these nine slices at 19 weeks, and therefore gives me full information. And I don't wait till 19 weeks. Uh, what you can do now is, again, switch that little button on and off, and not make these images like this, uh, like the top left, which is a very pretty image of the fetus, but doesn't tell us much except that the hands are forming. And so we say, OK, this is about eight weeks. But it tells me that the major vascularity is doing fine that I'm looking at an umbilical cord which is coming out, and I can replace grayscale information with only vascular information. If I want to play around, I can play around with the brightness and the intensity of this, 
All of this is possible by touch buttons at the bottom of my screen, and I will show you one such screen. And you can combine as much grayscale and as much flow information as you want. You can also get outline information, both on the grayscale and in here. And that's called silhouette gray, and this is called silhouette flow. And therefore, and you can intensify that and see it like this. And look how nicely you can actually demonstrate vessels going right up the neck of the fetus, and that's the beginning of the carotid system sitting right there. And if there's something wrong, you'll know that, yes, there is indeed something wrong uh, right there at this very, very early stage. What I was mentioning was this, that we no longer have to sit and remember what does what. I have a touch screen which knows that there's stupid people like me handling machines like this. And do you want an image like this? Okay, I press, I get that. If I want a flow HD glass body, which means grayscale plus color, I press this and I get that. If I see this here, it's a glass body silhouette. I have outlines of my grayscale, some degree of outline of my vessel, and I get that. And if I want to play around with the light and get more information, I can work on a studio system. I can play with my color flow silhouette outlines here at the left bottom, my gray silhouette. I can alter the gray threshold. I can actually alter the transparency of the whole image and also alter the threshold of my color flow mapping. Does this mean that things are getting complicated? No. Most of the time, you have a one touch. One, two, three, and four. You press on it, you get the desired image because it's all preset. What you can do is make it more exotic or more appealing or perhaps touch up some of the lower velocities and you will get your answers and those are sitting right here and you will use those along with your total 2D game. When you do this, then you can get images of the kind that I'm going to show you, which is here. Typically, we notice that there should have been, as I showed you earlier, a nice beautiful vena cava sitting between the heart uh, that you see here and the vessels behind. But here we see one vessel right close to the aorta. And when we see a vessel like that, I say, yes, I know that uh, that should have been a vena cava there. There isn't a vessel. I therefore have an azygous system uh, which has come up uh, instead there. Therefore, I know that there's been an interruption of the vena cava and I'm getting uh, a very clear demonstration both in terms of the lowest, uh, low images, one of which is color and one of which is in a monochrome. I notice that there's a little bit, I'm going to answer one uh, of, uh, or two of your questions. And the first one is, so where can we derive our centile values from? The centiles are available uh, all over the internet and also in standard textbooks. So you don't have to worry about the centiles. And um, they would be there, for instance, if you were to look um, at the centiles for flow for growth restriction. Uh, you will find that these centiles are there um, in a large number of textbooks. And the new one that you have, uh, which is authored by Christopher Lees, as well as by Jerry Visser and the entire group, um, uh, that has all the centiles uh, that you will ever need uh, for all the vessels. It also has the centiles uh, for growth, and it has a beautiful set of the customized uh, uh, growth. And then it says, can show access to four chamber view? Yes. Uh, towards the end, I will re show you the access to the four chamber view. Remember that previously we used to draw lines across. The posterior line used to go from the spine to the um, anterior portion, and then we used to have a second line that used to cross it. But we did realize that you have to go to the crux of the heart to get these lines right. And once you do that, then you know that, yes, uh, we're doing uh, pretty well. Uh, bear with me. How far from the origin should we measure uterine artery flows? And what is the significance of the notch with good diastolic flows? The notch is irrelevant. We don't use it anymore. Um, in terms of where from the origin, we know that the uterine artery comes through the infundibulopelvic ligament and comes to the lateral wall of the uterus where it gives up a descending branch towards the cervix and continues upwards in the cervical uterine isthmus and then forms the main uterine artery. So this point, after it has given off the descending branch, is the area where I would like to insulate it in the most proximal portion. And just to make sure you're insulating the vessel correctly, make sure that the velocities are absolutely correct. So I think we seem to be doing all right for the moment. 
and we will now move on to some of the other images uh, that I had intended to show you and that was this. And that was this to show you that look, this is ordinary flow and what we started now working on is shiny flow which is called radiant flow and it's not just a gimmick, it actually enhances the degree of color in proportion to velocity. It gives you much better edges. There is far less bleeding. And look how beautifully you can actually outline here the interventricular septum, fill out each vessel, including the outflows, fill out each vessel, including the pulmonary vessels, make sure that even at this velocity, you're picking up even part of the spirovena cava and the pulmonary veins. And then you can reconstruct with, uh, with your simple technique and get a nice, beautiful uh, view of the convergence of the pulmonary artery in the water. You can do exactly that also, step by step, to show the crossover. You know, transposition of the lead arteries is life threatening. And yet, it's a condition we miss the most on our antenatal scans. So we figured, what do we do? We get our standard four chamber view. We go a little higher, we get our standard five chamber view, and we switch on color, and we acquire in sleep. And once we've done that, we get something like this, which you can then either visualize by a TUI, or you go step by step, turn it over, till you get them on fast. You use magic cut to cut off the top like this, and once you cut off the top, you re-rotate that, and bravo, you fixed up everything there, and the next step with a little bit of shadowing is an image like this. This is not one touch, but the more you use this, the easier it is. And you know we have several programs organized almost every other weekend or at least once in a month. We can come and learn these techniques hands-on on the machine. And uh, we have these demonstrations. In fact, we have one coming up in Mahabaleshwa this weekend and another one coming up in Ahmedabad the very next weekend. So uh, be in touch with us and you can be at those workshops as well. What is a one touch is the greatest progress we've seen in flow evaluation that I have ever seen in the last 41 years that I've been doing after some scan, which is 42. And that is something called slow flow. We are detecting extremely low flow, very, very minimal centimeters per second, and showing lovely vessels not only like the very colossal artery here, but the vessels all along the brain stem like so. Each of the branches, and if you want to look just at the vessels, you can switch off the background, grayscale, and look at just the vessel. What is more remarkable is that by changing the map, you can get an even better delineation, and look at this circular villus in this extremely young fetus. You know that the posterior cranial fossa is not even differentiated as yet. We're obviously sitting at something that is between 13 and 14 weeks. We're getting a complete circular bilis by just pressing a button for slow flow. And this has been the greatest because fetal flows are slow. And one of the most useful uh, ways of looking at uh, the corpus callosum, of course, is this. But apart from that, Look at how you can differentiate on whether an echogenic enlarged kidney has function or not. It is the difference between a polycystic kidney and an echogenic uh, kidney from a growth disorder like uh, Beckwith uh, Widman or um, a, a kidney uh, that might just have uh, been a little swollen because of cytomegalovirus infection and not the usual trisomy 13 type. What you do, you switch on slow flow at the level of the kidneys you get the aorta, you get the main, uterine, the main uh, renal artery, and you get parenchymal flow within the kidney like this. You can use either this map or you can use this map, it doesn't really matter. But look how exquisitely you're actually picking up flow within the parenchyma of the kidney as early as this stage of development. Notice that there isn't even an abnormality of amniotic fluids, and uh, you're quite happy then that these kidneys are functioning. You can modify the slow to even lesser, and at this stage pick up beautifully the inferior vena cava, the ductus venosus, and the descending aorta, 
all neat and nicely because the window that you picked is absolutely correct. I want to show you that this even works within the fetal orbit. And here we have images that clearly show you. I will just go back to that if I can, unless it's going to pack up again. Oh, yes, it has decided to pack up again. I must apologize for this. And next time I will get less heavy talks for my webinars because I did realize that this was getting too heavy. But I'll try and skip from that and go back to where I was. We don't have that many slides left. I just wanted to show you more aspects of this slow flow. And while we give it for this to begin, I will take you through some of the question answer sessions that we could complete while we were waiting. And then we will uh, get organized with this. And I will remember that, yes, sometimes these talks get a little too heavy because the videos are so heavy. But there was so much I wanted to share with you and so much I wanted to help you with in terms of this, yes. So the question was, fetal circulation of kidneys and adrenals, you've seen that. The question was, ductus venosus importance in growth restriction, we've discussed that. Uh, so what is the earliest gestation age to call it as early FGR? As early as the 11 to 14 weeks window, if you have dated that pregnancy already. It's not a question of 16 or 19 or 21. You just pick it up as early as the 11 to 13 weeks window. What is spectral Doppler? The color in the vessels is called color flow mapping. And the waveforms are called spectral Doppler. Um, then there is, um, has elastography any role in fetal assessment of movements? I'm not familiar with that. We could work on that sometime in the future. Fetal flow RI normative. And I'm afraid I don't use RI anymore. We only use the pulsatility index. If I'm only going to be using PIs, I have no idea where I've gone and left the RI normatives. I just don't use them. I don't even think about them anymore. And therefore, we will just shift to PIs because the world is shifted to PIs. And we truly must share all of this um, with the world that, yes, I will do PIs because you are doing PIs. And then we will open our talk again. And meanwhile, while it is opening, it says, sir, how to measure the aortic isthmus? Well, you visualize the aortic isthmus. And the way I do it now is not in a longitudinal section. The way I now measure the, now I look at the aortic isthmus is that for measuring, I just go to my three vessel view and I see the junction of the ductus arteriosus with the aorta and I say, okay, but that is where my isthmus is expected. I recognize the waveform. I will put my Doppler there and I will get my answer straightforward. I will use a PI because you know there is a reversal. And as uh, the fetus gets more and more uh, anoxic um, or hypoxic, uh, then we realize that there is a reversal of flow in part of the cycle. And in the severely um, anoxic fetus, we have a flow throughout the cycle. And therefore, uh, we said, okay, we shall. That is what we shall use for uh, measuring. So we always use um, that portion uh, of the three vessel view. Um, there's a very interesting question. Uh, to what gestation age we should report you try an RGPI? Um, we should report it from 11 weeks to 41 weeks. From 11 weeks to 41 weeks, we must report this. That is extremely important because it is relevant all the way to the end. We do know that there is early term, which is 37 and 38, uh, between 37 and 0 days to 38 weeks, 6 days. There is term, which is 39 weeks to 40 weeks. And there's post term, which is 40 weeks plus. And the uterine artery PI is significant in any of these because you can also have term FGR. Does the biophysical profile have any relevance now? And not for decision making for growth restriction, but it definitely does in a scenario of decreased fetal movements in the third trimester because of chorioamnionitis or a cord event such as a knot in the cord. And in that situation, I would say that we certainly, certainly must realize that we absolutely have to be sensible enough and uh, go on to realize that we must use a biophysical profile because then there is nothing wrong with the doctor there is something wrong with the fetal environment. 
So this is where we were when we were interrupted, and this is to show you how beautifully Flow can coexist with excellent images. This is 31 weeks. And I don't want to lose my anatomy. I want to see my valves. I want to look for regurgitation. I want to look for any abnormality. And I want to make sure that I get enough of a visualization of the offset of my valves. All I do is switch on slow flow and I get my answers. And I leave these questions uh, for a little while later. Remember that there has been one other great advance in flow, and that advance in flow is what we refer to as the bike plane studies, which means <clears throat> that at the same time, in real time, I have my three vessel view in one view, and I'm getting my entire arch in the opposite view. In this situation, I am focusing and making sure on whether the vessel I'm getting at that moment in time is the uh, aorta, is the pulmonary artery, and what does it look like? And if there was an abnormality, what does it look like? And this happens with the electronic um, uh, 3D transducer, and it works fantastically. It has good sensitivity, and you can see three vessel view on one side. I have something I can focus here. If I take it into the pulmonary arch, I will get a pulmonary arch. If I take it into the aorta, I will get the aortic arch, and therefore my job becomes much simpler. Where else does fetal flow help us? Look at these two images, and I'll just take a sip of water. On the left, on the top, I see a fetus with a bulge from the abdominal wall, and bottom right, I see a fetus with a bulge from the abdominal wall. When I see this, and I trace my <clears throat> umbilical cord, I prove one of my oldest pieces of learning. If the cord insertion is at the apex of the lesion, I know it's an omphalous seal. And if I see the cord entering the abdomen at the base of the lesion, I know that I'm looking at a gastroschisis. And therefore, again, the power of fetal flow in giving me a differential diagnosis, because if it's gastroschisis, <clears throat> I don't need a karyotype. If it's an omphalous seal, I have a very high incidence, a trisomy 21, I need an urgent karyotype. And therefore, there is a world of difference. The omphalous seal, has a good prognosis if there isn't an abnormal karyotype. The gastroschisis is worse if there's too much of gastroschisis and early gastroschisis. And therefore, you have to differentiate these. Another example. I want to know whether a lesion here in the thorax looks triangular. And I was thinking more in terms of a sequestration. Different prognosis from a CPAM. But because it was basal and it was triangular, I was thinking of a sequestration. The moment I switch on color, I realize that the aorta is completely clean. And look how beautifully it works when you use a TUI. The entire aorta shows absolutely no vessels coming to this. It cannot be a sequestration, it must be a CPAM. My prognosis becomes just a little guarded. And I say, look, we'll see you again. If I find too much of a blotch of vascularity, I go to silhouette mode and I say, oh yes, of course, there is nothing coming through the aorta. I see my mass over there. All the supply is coming from pulmonary artery vessels. My question is answered uh, straight away. Let's see some more examples of how flow helps us. Here, you have a patient with a background of developing an atrioventricular heart block because the mother has systemic lupus erythematosus. We now know that to look for arrhythmias, we do not get obsessed with M mode. We start using pulse Doppler, and we realize that we can then get a reading when we have the pulse body placed near the mitral valve leaflet in the left ventricular outflow tract, and measurement is made from the onset of the transmitral A wave to the onset of left ventricular um, ejection. And that then is known as the mechanical PR interval. And in the fetus, this is 0.12 plus minus 0.002 seconds when measured from either the mitral or the aortic valve region. <clears throat> Prolongation of the mechanical PR interval beyond an upper cutoff of 0.14 uh, tells me that about one third of these patients are being in trouble. 
that is an excellent, simple way of looking at flow, quantifying the flow, thereby measuring the actual mechanical PR interval and being able to predict disease. Remember that it is quite tricky to actually get neat, clean outlines on M mode and it's very easy if you place the transducer like this, which means I'm including one leaflet on the mitral valve and I'm including one leaflet on the aortic valve, and then I get nice clean ones here, simple things like by Germany and so on. But truly speaking, anywhere where I want to look in arrhythmia, I now use a flow parameter such as Doppler. I don't use M mode, which is actually uh, anatomy mode or, or motion mode. I actually use Doppler to assess this. Some other specific situations, uh, and twin pregnancies is one of them. We know that you have third trimester complications in twin pregnancies, and in most of them, flow is going to help you. So in fetal growth restriction, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, the center previa and umbilical cord accidents in twins, I'm going to have to use Doppler to try and improve the outcome and predict the outcome. Also, in, 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 in monochorionic twins, uh, in most of the complications, I'm going to have to use flow information, whether it be TTTS, the a cardiac uh, trap twin, the umbilical cord entanglement, or conjoined twins, I'm going to have to demonstrate a lot of flow to be able to quantify that pregnancy. But the most common condition that we encounter, which is the TTTS, we realize uh, that the quintero staging, the moment you reach stage three, you can't do without flow. Absent in diastolic flow or reverse in diastolic flow in the umbilical artery, uh, absent forward flow or reverse flow in ductus venosus and pulsatile umbilical venous flow will differentiate between the really bad stuff and the not so bad stuff, and therefore you have it. We also have something called the CHOP score, which may not be uh, the best way of looking at, um, at what to decide, but again, that uses a lot of Doppler, including umbilical artery Doppler, and, uh, but it does help you to understand what the pathophysiology is, and therefore we use it a lot in these situations. And then, of course, you've already seen some examples, but to finish off, I wanted to show you uh, some bits on color Doppler in fetal cardiac evaluation. And we know that is what now tells us that, look, uh, use it liberally because it seems to work. I was expecting this disaster, my apologies, but I think this will open up on its own. And meanwhile, uh, we will pretend like this is the most natural thing in the world and go on to answer some more questions. And the question is, best time to assess your trend Doppler, which we already answered, and that is from 11 weeks to 41 weeks. So can we do color Doppler study and all fancy silhouette study at eight weeks? Uh, rather, uh, should we do it? Fancy silhouette studies I would use in twins. I would use it if I found that the curves of my fetus are not showing up correctly. What does that mean? It means that normally I expect that the fetus has an anterior curve and a posterior curve. And if I don't find that, I want to know what's wrong with anatomy. And in that situation, I would straight away go and do a, a transparency mode with silhouette to look at my fetal outline. And I would do a silhouette on the vessels to look at my vascular outline and I would even do it at seven weeks, I wouldn't even wait later nine weeks because I need a diagnosis as soon as possible. Why should my patient have to suffer uh, when we can find answers for them in the right way, at the right time, and so on? So we should now move on to the last section, which is uh, the recommendations on how to actually do Doppler for cardiac evaluation. We've shown some of these already, but I really want you to have a list of this bit where in the heart we'd like to see it for presence or absence of flow, uh, such as in early gestation, also complicated anatomy in the second and the third trimester scans, uh, flow across an atretic or a dysplastic valve because it might look atretic in 2D, may not truly be uh, atretic on 3D, flow across a DSD and a narrow pulmonary artery. I also like to look for it to see whether there is anti-grade or retrograde flow particularly in synotic lesions of the outflows of the heart. And then in the three vessel view, you will find most of your answers. It will also help you to understand um, abnormal jets to stenotic uh, uh, other valves, like us with regurgitation, 
the detection of ventricular coronary fistulas, um, and also for uh, the ones that we find in family atresia. Also, some very small vessels, like flow in an LSVC may not be very minimal. We might have tortuous ductus arterio, so dilated as you go away. You like to see these, then you say, okay, this is where I will use this. There is no doubt that you need to have some color considerations, and that is this. That is that the velocity scale should be at greater than or equal to 30 centimeters per second for arterial or chamber flow, and 10 to 20 centimeters per second for venous circulation, and then look how beautifully you can get the outline. And I just got so addicted to radiant flow, I truly uh, don't choose anything else anymore. Also, um, uh, examples here, first trimester, purely the same settings, and we do it. And do remember that color and the three vessel is now the way to go for assessing everything that we ever wanted to know about cardiac disease. We don't use the four chamber view as much. We use color and the three vessel view to get our answers. We use it all the time for demonstration of an aortic override, as you see here in your classical tetralogy of follow. We also use it all the time for any odd vessel that might be coming out, such as demonstration of a common arterial trunk. Um, and then, of course, we extend it way beyond just color flow uh, to a situation like this, where you see just large vessels with everything just pouring through them, and you realize that this is an absent pulmonary valve. And look at how gigantic the two branch pulmonary arteries are. And you know, yes, this is the way to get my answer. You also use it for studying flow, say, across the foramen ovale. The scale function uh, has to be uh, combined with flow function, we, and we can't do one without the other. And even in things like flow across the VSD, we truly must uh, try and see whether we are looking at a truly intact interventricular septum or we're not looking at a truly intact interventricular septum, because if you don't have uh, uh, flow, then you might be missing a lot of VSDs. Does it really matter if we miss a VSD? Not really, because most of them would close. But in the Indian context, and the nastiness of our psyche, they'd say, you know, doctor, there was this large four millimeter VSD that you missed. Four millimeters is not large. And they will close on their own. But that is our mentality in our part of the world. They don't want to miss those. So I just switch on color for just about everything uh, that I use so that I don't miss out on small ones like this one. So technically speaking, I don't do ultrasound without flow function anymore. Do remember that, therefore, we have an expanded feature, like I said in the beginning, fetal physiology, a re-understanding of what we use in terms of our conventional Doppler, great new information on fetal anatomy by using flow, a differential diagnosis of anomalies, a prognosis of anomalies, Marcus anomalies like the ARSA, and repeat, 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 it's perfectly safe. Thank you indeed for your attention.